First of all, let me say, ask you, how many of you have ever heard of Paul Green before this program was organized? Raise your hand if you had heard of Paul Green. And how many of you had been to the Lost Colony? And I met Mr. Charlton here this evening, who told me that he was in the Lost Colony back in the late 40s, after the show, after the show, you all may not have known that about him. And he was a, he was a colonist. He was a colonist, and what was your line? Long live the queen. <laughs> Now I'm going to try to work this little machine here. I'm going to begin this evening with an excerpt from Paul Green's little book called Rassy. I have met many smart men in my time and learned much from them all. But the person I learned most from was a little Negro boy by the name of Rassy McLeod, whom I used to know when I was a child there on my father's farm in eastern North Carolina. Now in these latter days and looking out far and wide across my own beloved country, I think much on Rassy and some of the things that he taught me when we were both tiny boys and bosom buddies in the long, long ago. I remember vividly as if it were yesterday, the day he and I first met up with each other. I was out in front of my father's house playing in the sand clogged water ditch and I was little enough to still be wearing some sort of dress, but I was big enough to know that I was about my own business, which was the making of a frog house. <laughs> now this was done by burrowing one bare foot in the sand, piling the damp dirt carefully, padded over, and then gently pulling my foot out, leaving a snug little cave for any home-seeking frog. Will McLeod, a Negro tenant who had recently moved to my father's farm, came by and he had a little black boy with him. What you doing, fella? Will asked me. Fixing a wog house, I said. Now, Lord, ain't that nice. A what? A wog house. <laughs> well, what you gonna put in it? Wogs. <laughs> you mean frogs. Wogs. <laughs> this seemed to tickle Will, and he laughed and then patted my head. And my mother came across the yard. The little black boy stood there and grinned at me, and I grinned back at him. I want to try this waist pattern on him. Will, can you hang, hand him here? So Will reached down and pulled me up, and I began yelling and kicking. But Mama got out, down on her knees, and she measured up and pinned the piece on my shoulder and on my back. Now you be quiet, she said. I'm getting set to make you some riches like Rassy. And I was quiet. <laughs> he and Rassy done sizing up each other. Miss Betty, how old is he? He'll be four in the fall. How old is Rassy? Well, he'll be about four too. Can they play with each other if they don't fight? <laughs> and from that day on, Rassy and I were cronies. And how free I could run now in my little waist button trousers that Mama soon provided. He and I were too small to plow or do much hoeing in the fields for the next three years, though in the fall we would pick cotton for the rest of the folks, and through the summers we walked down to the creek and waiting and looking for, for fish. And Rassy taught me many things. Taught me how to pop my finger joints. Taught me how to spit tobacco juice through my front teeth. <laughs> taught me how to bandage up sores with jimson weed and how to chew sassafras bark or green pine needles to kill off the power of the nicotine on our breath. <laughs> then he told me if I would get a little fish swimmer out of the inside of a fish and swallow it, I'd be able to swim just like a fish. So with a hook baited with a worm, we finally caught a little pike, cut him open, and took out the inflated air sac, and with great swallows of creek water, I finally got the sack down. And then to Rassie's prompting, I took off my clothes and dived into the creek and fell on the bottom just like a rock. Well, Rassie had to jump in clothes and all, and he was laughing and whooping, and then he confessed that he was tricking me like old man, and old man Cofield had once tricked him. 
I was mad as hops, but I soon forgave my partner because he really taught me how to, how to swim, and he taught me how to tread water, and he taught me how to float on my back like a cork. And the days were swift and golden then, and I loved my little black playmate better than father or mother or anybody else in the whole wide world, and I knew and planned that we would stay together forever. And so Paul Green begins writing about his life from the age of three in this little book called Rassy. And I have begun this story this evening because the Paul Green, with his accounting of this as a child, we see the powerful spark of the purpose for his entire life in those early years. The love and the deep appreciation for his partner, his bosom buddy, would inform the rest of his long life. <clears throat> Here is Paul and his brother Hugh in the First War. <clears throat> Paul Green would write in his 1917 diary when he was in boot camp his disgust for the way the other soldiers were mistreating a young Negro youth, tossing him up and down in a blanket. He would write Him to the Rising Sun, a one-act play in 1936, when he heard about the two black chain gang members whose legs had to be amputated because their boss had left them in an unheated cell overnight. And he wrote a play and sent a copy to every legislator, which was the beginning of the end of the chain gang in North Carolina. And through all of his adult life, Paul would pound tables in Raleigh with his fellow crusader, Jonathan Daniels, publisher of the NNO, as they fought for proper and fair treatment of poor, oftentimes illiterate men, black and white, who were not assigned lawyers to fairly represent them. And sometimes they paid it out of their own pockets. And Paul Green would write plays that would break your heart about the sad and the unfulfilled lives of the Negroes. And he wrote stories also that were full of fun and humor. His little childhood friend, Rassy, lighting his way throughout his life. But let's go back to Harnett County. This is 1894, when Paul Elliott Green was born, the second of what would be a total of six children, to William Archibald and Betty Bird Green. When Paul was just 14 years old, his mother grabbed a hold of a mantle in their sitting room and collapsed and died of what we would probably think now was an aneurysm. And the oldest child, Mary, who was just 16, took over the raising of her two little brothers and her three little sisters. But Paul and his siblings had already learned much from their mother who was a well-educated musician and a poet herself. Betty Bird played the piano and the organ, and she always encouraged the children in their love of music, art, and writing. So much so that when Paul was a boy and then as a teen, he would follow along with his plow, holding the reins and the plow with one hand and a poetry book in the other, memorizing the verses. There's a lovely story. <coughs> about the time he loaded up his mule with corn to take it to the mill to grind. Mm. Sitting forward on the mule, the sun was in his eyes, so he just turned himself around backward, and the mule knew the way. <laughs> but along came his cousin, Will Long, who, joke, who jokingly called out to him, Paul, the mill is the other way. Well, so distracted from his reading, he turned himself back around but there was that sun again. So when his cousin left, he turned himself backwards again and consumed every, every, continued his reading. There's another favorite story we know about Paul Green's dedication to advancing himself in all things cultural. The family enjoyed the Sears Roebuck catalog, and in those days, I didn't know this, you could send away for stories or poems beside clothes and household goods. And he saw that he could get a violin with instructions 
for $2.95, the Stradivarius model. <laughs> so he saved up his money, and he sent away for it, and while he took breaks from his plowing in the shade of the tree, he taught himself to play the violin. Paul would pursue music all of his life, and every green child, grandchild, great-grandchild, all play musical instruments, including his two famous grandchildren, uh, pianist Frederick Moyer and cellist Nancy Green. <clears throat> Let's see, I think I skipped one somehow. Maybe I didn't. So here's Paul at age three. I think this is somewhere else, maybe. I think this is the one I want. <clears throat> so here, in fact, I can use this little pointer because I can show you who these folks are. So here is the father and the mother over here. Here's Mary and Paul and Hugh and Gladys <coughs> and little Kara Mae and the baby in the carriage is Irma. <clears throat> so the children were growing. And these, uh, these may not be, Kenny, I think maybe they're, uh, maybe have gotten out of order somehow, but we'll be fine. We'll be fine. Okay. So um, here the children are growing, and I love this picture, because imagine having a picture where all of your children are in the same picture. They're all in the same school. So here is Mary, right there. And then there's Paul. His little brother, Hugh, Gladys, whom some of you knew, her daughter, Alice Cox, and here's uh, Kara May, and here's the baby over here, Irma. All, all in the same picture. I think it's remarkable. Paul went on to graduate in 1914 from Bowie's Creek Academy, which is now Campbell University. He wanted very much to go to college, and his mother had always encouraged him. And he had his heart set on going to Chapel Hill, which is what it was called in those days, not Carolina, Chapel Hill. He wanted to study philosophy with the famous and also very irascible Dr. Horace Williams, who President Archibald Campbell of Bowie's Creek Academy called the head atheist up there in Chapel Hill. <laughs> Liable to teach you heretical things like evolution. <laughs> Campbell tried his mightiest to prevent Paul from going to Chapel Hill and into that bed of atheists, and he even got Paul a scholarship at the Baptist College at Wake Forest. But Paul would have none of it. He was determined to go to Chapel Hill, but he didn't have this money. So his father said, well, Paul, just work here on the farm with me for a year, and then you can go. And he did. He worked, and he was a champion cotton picker. In fact, he had a record of 403 pounds of cotton he picked in 10 hours at one point. <laughs> Besides his farm work, Paul was also asked to be the principal of a three-teacher Olive Branch school in Harnett County. He was 19. Now let's see if my things are working. Ah, it did. <laughs> There's Paul and, and his brother Hugh in the field. Well, the next year, his father said, well, Paul, work just one more year. So Paul said, OK. And he also started <coughs> pitching semi-professional baseball. As a matter of fact, he, he was scouted by the major leagues to play baseball. He was an amazing pitcher because he could pitch with other, either arm, his right or his left. And in those days, you didn't have to declare which one you were going to, to, to throw out. So that could be quite confusing. <laughs> he continued his teaching, his chopping up cotton, and pitching ball. In the third year, his father said, well, Paul, how about one more year? And Paul said, no. <laughs> and I'm happy to report that the, pa the father helped as much as he could. So Paul entered Chapel Hill in 1916 at the age of 22, four years older than a normal freshman. He lived in a dorm for a short while, but it was too noisy. Paul needed quiet throughout his life, 
And in each house where he and his wife and children lived, they always had some kind of a cabin or a barn outside where he could be away from the noise. And here is Paul Green's cabin, which was behind his house on Greenwood. And here is Paul inside, alone, reading. And here is Elizabeth, not alone, <laughs> inside with the children. Let me tell you who the children are. <clears throat> the big boy there is Paul Jr., and he is 93 and lives in Chapel Hill. The next one is Bird, Nancy Bird. She's 91 and lives in Morganton. This is Betsy. She lives in Boston. She's 87. And the baby, Jan, uh, who was a professor of English in Ohio, died in 2012. <clears throat> so now it's 1916, and Paul was so advanced in English at Chapel Hill that he was asked to teach it. <laughs> that year he won the freshman prize in English, and although he'd never seen a play, he wrote one and won the campus-wide playwriting competition. And of course he took philosophy classes from Horace Williams, but as John Ely said in a paper that he had presented some years ago at Methodist College, his accomplishments are not surprising. Paul Green had a tremendous IQ. I can't imagine an IQ any higher, said Ely. And later in that same paper, he gave us a humorous glimpse of what it was like to work with that atheist, Horace Williams. Y'all may that house is on Franklin Street. Y'all may have seen it before. John Ely writes, <coughs> after Paul graduated, he taught in the philosophy department, assisting Professor Williams, who was a great teacher, but considered a very poor writer. And the professor asked Paul to read his latest manuscript. Paul complied and felt the manuscript was just awful. <laughs> he managed to avoid the Williams for days, but the professor caught up with him on campus and asked Paul, did you read my manuscript? Now Paul knew that Professor Williams was the proudest man who had ever been born <laughs> and imagined himself an expert writer as well as a distinguished philosopher. He would not be able to bear the truth. And so for the first time in a long time, John Ely muses, Paul Green lied. <laughs> I had a dream last night, Professor, he said to Professor Williams, that my little house caught on fire, and the question in my mind was whether I was going to save your book or my baby. <laughs> well, Paul felt surely that would hold him. <laughs> but Williams said anxiously, and which one did you choose, Paul? <laughs> Paul saw no way out now. He said, I saved your book, Professor. <laughs> the professor walked on a ways and then stopped, staring in the horizon, looked back at Paul and said, you did right, Paul. <laughs> <clears throat> As you know, since 1914, the war had been brewing in Europe. And so after just one year at Chapel Hill, Paul felt it was his duty to support President Wilson to enlist in the war to end wars. So in 1917, he joined Company B, North Carolina, 105th Engineers, and was sent to Greenville, South Carolina to boot camp. This is a picture of him after he became an officer, which you can imagine didn't take long for them to see his talent. Paul Green had been keeping a diary for years. In a, book, in a boot camp, he had published locally a small leather-bound copy of a little book he called Trifles of Thought, just before he sailed for France. Because, as he wrote to a cousin many years later, I had in mind the suggestion that in case I was killed in the war, people would know I wanted to be a writer. In 1994, the Paul Green Foundation supported the publication of Paul Green's War Songs, a Southern poet's history of the Great War. <clears throat> Paul returned to school in 1919 and discovered that while he was gone, 
Professor Frederick Koch had arrived from North Dakota with a startling idea about plays that could be written about regular people, and he called them folk plays. And in that playwriting uh, class were Thomas Wolfe and Elizabeth Lay, who would become his wife. Here's the old playmaker's building from uh, 1852. This is a picture of in 1920. Paul graduated in 1921. He did a year of graduate work in philosophy, married Elizabeth, did a second year of uh, graduate work at Cornell, and then back in Chapel Hill, Paul taught not only in the philosophy department, but also in the drama department, and his writing continued and increased. By 1923, his one-act play, White Dresses, was produced in New York and other plays produced in Wyoming and Maryland. In 1925, his one-act, No Count Boy, won the coveted Belasco Cup. In the next year, 1926, In Abraham's Bosom played on Broadway in New York for 200 performances. In the following year, Paul Green won the Pulitzer Prize in drama. <coughs> Paul was associating with a lot of important writers. DeBose Haywood, uh, who wrote Porky and Bess. Um, Lynn Riggs, who wrote Green Grow the Lilacs, which became Oklahoma. Uh, other writers included Carl Sandburg, Zora Neale Hurston, Eugene O'Neill, James Boyd, his best friend, who lived down in Southern Pines, Betty Smith, and the list goes on. Thomas Wolfe, Sherwood Anderson, F. Scott Fitzgerald. And when Paul drove William Faulkner to New York to attend a conference, Paul made Faulkner move to the back seat so he could drink his moonshine so the police would not see him. <laughs> <laughs> and that story is, is an amazing story. At one point, he rolled the window down, even though he was in the back seat, and offered the policeman a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Those were heady literary days, and Paul was in the midst of it. Paul's successes were happening very quickly now, and his first play uh, for the group theater was performed in 1931, The House of Conley, and a magnificent play. But the writing, the lecturing, and the country, around the country, traveling abroad with President Truman as a representative to UNESCO, rehearsing with the group theater in New York, and his family responsibilities meant that he had to give up his teaching, and he took a leave from the university. But during that time, Paul began writing screenplays for Hollywood, sometimes taking his family, and other times leaving him, them at home. <clears throat> now, wherever Paul was, he was going to be doing farming. So here he is in Pacific Palisades, and he and Elizabeth are making a garden. He just simply was a farmer in the first place. He was enamored of the movie industry, and he saw great possibilities. He was under contract to write for big stars, Will Rogers, Janet Gaynor, Lou Ayers. He wrote State Fair. And in Betty Davis, he wrote, for, she, was, she starred in Cabin in the Cotton. And Betty Davis claimed that her favorite line of any line she ever had in a movie was what Paul Green had written for her. I'd love to kiss you, but I just washed my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Green made a lot of money in Hollywood, and he was allowed, he was able to buy a lot of land in Chapel Hill, and he could provide quite well for his family. But he grew tired and disappointed with the shallow and too often lewd movies that were coming out of Hollywood. He was a serious writer. He wanted to write about serious issues, and he didn't want his work cheapened. Catherine Ann Porter, a Pulitzer Prize winning Texas playwright, was also writing screenplays at the same time in Hollywood. And here's how she described him. I'll put on my Texas accent. <clears throat> the honest, tender, gifted soul stood out like a stalk of good sugar cane in a thicket of poison ivy. 
he was, so after a number of years, Paul did give up most of his screenwriting, which gave him more time to do other work. And in 1935, he wrote his magnificent novel. He only wrote two novels called This Body, the Earth, published by Harper Collins. In 1936, he collaborated with the newly escaped Kurt Weill from Nazi Germany, who had just escaped to the States. And they performed a, they, they produced a, a play called Johnny Johnson. Paul Green wrote the play and the lyrics, and Kurt Weill wrote the music. But Paul became disenchanted with the way Broadway plays were so exclusive, and they weren't ready for the regular people. And people couldn't get to New York. So Paul was commissioned by the folks in Dare County, North Carolina, to write a drama for the 350th anniversary of the arrival of the British to Roanoke Island, 1587 to 1937. And here is Paul writing The Lost Colony. <clears throat> the Lost Colony was first produced in 1937 and was a, his own creation, and he called it symphonic drama. Paul had studied theater in Europe on two Guggenheim fellowships. He was well aware of the Greek theater and their outdoor performances. He was fascinated with sound and light that he had seen in France. And he put it all together for his new passion, music, dance, songs, stories, lights, all for the ordinary people who could see plays in their own communities. He wrote 17 outdoor dramas all together, all across the country, from Virginia to Texas. And then in 19, and there he is in another one of his outdoor dramas. In 1940, Richard Wright, author of Native Son, sought him out to write the stage play for his well-received novel. Now picture Richard Wright, a black man from Chicago, coming to North Carolina in the height of Jim Crow. Well, when he, when he came to Paul's house and word got out <coughs> that this black man was collaborating with this white man, and furthermore, they were in his home and it was mixed company, well, Paul's kin got wind of it. Our Paul Green, bosom buddy of Rassy McLeod, was not like some of his kin who were avowed racist and members of the Klan. Word was that there was going to be trouble. So when Richard went to his rooming house over in the colored part of town, Paul secretly followed him and hid in the bushes with his baseball bat. Remember his baseball playing. And I can tell you more about that story later. Here is William Hip doing the bust for the Paul Green Theater. In 1978, the Paul Green Theater opened with a grand celebration and the showing of Paul Green's play, Johnny Johnson. In 19, excuse me, in 2014, after 36 years, uh, Johnny Johnson came back to Chapel Hill a couple years ago. And there's the bust, as many of you have seen at Playmakers. And I thought you'd also enjoy this. Here is that little three-year-old <coughs> and five-year-old Mary, whoopsie, I'm sorry, um, Mary and little Paul. And look at the big, great big old bow at his neck, which has been made from the scraps of her dress, no doubt. <laughs> and 81 years later, here's his beloved sister who raised him and all the children and Paul. The next year, Paul was named Dramatist Laureate of North Carolina. And I'll end by telling you that just a few weeks before Paul died in 1981, at the age of 87, he gave a talk entitled Memories of Thomas Wolfe. It was at the UNC Wilson Library. And we think this may be the last picture made of him. Then, just three days before he died, he wrote many letters of thanks and response to friends about various things, including writing three letters on the day he died, May the 4th. Imagine. 
with the last bit of energy then, he went out to his great tractor and pulled it into the shed and came back into the house and passed into the next world. And here he is in half healthy, healthier, happy days, his replacement for the, the plow and, and the mule. Here's a highway marker down in uh, Harnett County. But I need to tell you one more thing. We started out this morning with Rassi, the, the, earlier this evening with Rassi, because Paul's life began with Rassi. And so I'd like to end with Rassi. What I hadn't told you was that as much as Paul had planned to be pals forever, it turned out that he would only have him in his heart and in his mind, in his writing and in his living. Because when the boys were just 10, Rassi's family came down with typhoid, and it was all over the countryside. Each day, Paul begged to go to the tenant's house to see Rassi, but he wasn't allowed. Mary went every day to help the distraught parents with the McLeod children, sick and dying. Then one day, Mary said to Paul to come with her. She carried along a clean white nightshirt that belonged to Paul wrapped in a paper, and when they got to the tenant shack, Rassi was lying on the floor on a pallet. Paul thought he was sleeping and went over to him and touched him, and he was cold, and he collapsed in sobs. But Mary got Paul to help him wash his little body. <coughs> and Paul, writing in this story, said that he was careful not to wash Rassi's sore toe because he had stubbed it, and he didn't want to hurt him. They put him in the clean nightshirt, and Mary told her little brother that earlier in the day, Rassi had risen up on his pallet to say that Paul should have his Barlow knife. And I've got to find the Barlow knife, which I had here, and have stuck away, and I'll show it to you later, <laughs> the very Barlow knife. And, um, and, and so she went to retrieve it from the mantle and gave it to Paul and told him that she reckoned it was a good fair trade for the swap of the nightshirt. And of course, young Paul was devastated, but he set about their work with their father to build a wooden box. And then Paul writes, it was evening now and almost dark. Papa got an old shovel and we went up into the fields and there under the big cedar tree, we dug Rassie's grave and buried him. And when we were ready to go, I said, ain't you going to say a little something over him, Papa? My father hesitated a moment, pulled off his hat, and in the thickening gloom said, in such an hour as ye know not, the Son of Man cometh, and we all got to be ready to go on the last day, blessed be his holy name. But he hadn't said anything about Rassie being in heaven. For like a great many folks in North Carolina at that time, he was still a bit uncertain whether Negroes really had full-fledged souls and would, not, would be allowed in heaven. But I knew that Rassi was in heaven. He'd gone straight to heaven and was at that moment standing by the throne of God and the, the angels were crowded around him, petting him. And when Papa went on home ahead of me, calling back for me to come, I drove a sharp little piece of plank down into the ground. It was good dark now, and the evening star was shining. I took out the Barlow knife, and in the gloom, I carved a little cross. Next day, I would come and cut some words. Rassi, he sleeps here. A long while I stood there, looking down at the grave, the hot tears scalding my face. And then, with swelling, breaking heart, I turned and followed after my father. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have, and I'll try to find the Barlow knife. Do we know the burial place of Rassi? Well, I can tell you what happened next, and it would be in this book is years later when he went to check it, it had, they had planted crops there. And then he realized that 
the grassy was down underneath there, and he felt that was kind of good because he was helping grow the cotton. Any other questions? Tell us about Richard Wright's time in Chapel Hill and uh, collaborating on that play. Oh, it was, it was an incredible opportunity for the two of them. They met in a, somebody gave them a room at the, at the, at the university there. And in uh, the name of the hall is escaping me right now. And they worked, and I've got lovely pictures of them working together. Of course, they're both smoking cigarettes. And they're both typing and working on this, on this stage play together. And that went very well um, until they got to Broadway. And uh, the, the producers of it were working with, with uh, Richard Wright to try to encourage him to change the ending where there was no hope for this, for this man. It's a tragic story if you have read uh, In Abraham's Bosom, which you may not have. Um, and Paul wanted so much to have, it, have some uplift at the end. And so in the end, Richard Wright and Paul Green became quite estranged from each other because they could not agree and, and it's at one point, uh, Richard Wright is saying, how can, you, how can you write that? How can you say you know that? You're not a black man, and you're writing about that. And Paul says, I was raised with him. But then they had this disagreement, which continued until they, their friendship was not, did not continue. Richard Wright died very young. And um, he could have gone on, I'm sure, to do many more wonderful things. But the, the end of the story about Paul Green hiding in the bushes, <clears throat> Later, they went up to Chicago. And there was some kind of a fracas, some kind of a racial fracas. And Richard Wright apologized to Paul, saying, I'm so sorry that there was this problem when everything was so calm in Chapel Hill. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul said, I never told him <laughs> otherwise. Next one. Yeah, if you uh, read the description of Paul Green there, he said he was a champion of racial equality, a foe of militarism and capital punishment. He's probably what we would describe today as a classic liberal. Do you think if you're alive today, in today's great cause of equal rights is uh, homosexual rights, do you speculate that Paul Green would be in favor of a recognition of gay marriage? I absolutely do. Uh, the foundation was, was formed in 1982, the year after Paul Green died. And the, his wife, Elizabeth, and four children gave up all of their rights to his, to his vast production of work. And so they gave up all the royalties and, and started the foundation because they wanted to carry on his work. And sir, I can tell you that the Paul Green Foundation is opposed to the death penalty. I know that that is not what everyone believes, of course. But that is what Paul believed. He thought it was a sin. I'm not going to be able to say it quite right, but it's a sin to be, to take somebody else's life from them. And he was known as the lone vigil in the early days when, of course, we were still executing people in the big house at 2 o'clock in the morning. And nobody was there, and he felt like he needed to be there. And he became known as the lone vigil. Nowadays, of course, we haven't executed anyone since 2006. But now, Hundreds of people gather if there is an execution, the people of faith against the death penalty. So uh, that is one of our causes, is to, is to try to abolish the death penalty. And, um, and your question is quite good, but I know that Paul Green was very liberal in his thinking. Uh, he was always for the underdog. We've noticed the story of the chain gang, anybody that was being mistreated. He also, there was a, a time when the Indian children, the young Native American children in, in that area were not able to go to the regular school. They had to be carted some really far distance to go to school. And so he worked with some folks over in, in the triad in Greensboro and raised some money so that those children could go over and go to school properly, those Native American children. Did I answer that sufficiently, sir? Yeah, you uh -huh. Yes. Um, I just wanted to mention, as part of, I, I thought it was fascinating that the Greens were so interested in music, because I understand, you know, our Alice Cox, that we all, 
I hope many of you knew because she was a wonderful woman. But Alice uh, went to Converse um, and majored in piano. Yes. Uh, her mother, Gladys, lived in Richlands and was the town piano teacher. Yes. And Jean Taylor and many others had taken piano from Gladys. And they said that not only was Gladys a, a wonderful musician, but she grew beautiful roses and she knew more about the stock market than about anybody in town. And Jean Taylor said every good tip he got, he got from her. <laughs> Paul Green was also, thank you, Lynette. Paul Green was also very interested in plants and herbs and. And there's a, one of the books out there is a two-volume book. It's 1,245 pages. For 60 years, he carried three-by-five cards in his pocket. And whenever you heard somebody say, say something, some little slang thing, things that we have heard as children, and then I heard Brickbat the other day. And I said to Dave, I haven't heard Brickbat for a long time. So we Googled it. Of course, modern, you know, we asked his phone what Brickbat meant. And, um, he, he wrote all that stuff down, and he also wrote all about herbs and, and, and uh, remedies for things. And so he had a wonderful uh, interest in, in life, in the nature, in the natural world. Marcia, tell him about uh, his daughter's book about the... Uh, uh, and so as a result of... Yeah, so as a result of this book that has so many plants, the descriptions of them and where he saw them, his, his daughter, Betsy, who lives in Boston, who's a wonderful photographer, came down a couple of years ago and worked with the North Carolina Botanical Garden with their botanist. And they traveled all around to where Paul had gone and seen various things and took pictures of them. And so she has this lovely small book that's called Paul Green's Plant Book. So she's actually taken the words and the research from her father's book, which is all in black and white, and has made this beautiful book with these beautiful colored flowers. Yes. You know, Goldsboro, people in Goldsboro have a very special place in their heart for the Lost College because Clifton Britton was the director of the Lost College for many years. He taught at Goldsboro High and mm -hmm. uh, George Stratwine was the musical director there. And Andy Griffith actually came and taught at Goldsboro High. Yes, so indeed. Talk to us a little bit about, a little more about Paul Brennan and the Lost College. Mm. Well, you know, they, they first had a movie uh, Phil, uh, that they did in 1921. Someone had put together that, uh, that movie. And I, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to tell you much more about that. Um, I know that, um, I know that, the, that it was supposed to be for one year, and it went on for another year and for another year, and now it's still going full, full steam. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have any part in the Lost Colony. The foundation does not receive anything from the Lost Colony because it was uh, a work for hire. Um, and so that, um, and it's changed through the years. And of course, they've, they've, you, you all have seen it. So many of you have seen it. They you know, put all that makeup on. And I'll tell you, one of the things that he loved and I'm, I'm sure I can't find it, but he, he has on the back of this picture, on the back of that picture, he has this paragraph that's written. He said, they did something that I absolutely cannot believe they did. They came in here, they dug a trench all the way around that theater, the entire, in order to take this picture. They dug a trench all around the theater, and then they put gunpowder in it, or whatever you put in there, and then lit it. And that's what, that's the light we're seeing. And he was so amazed at that process. I, I should have brought the exact wording, but it was quite cheap. That's the light we're seeing, not, yeah. yeah. Uh, President, uh, President um, FDR Roosevelt came in his wheelchair and they made a special place for his wheelchair to be up here. Um, uh, Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt came. Um, I know that in 1950, when some writers got together, and Margaret and I are involved with another organization called the North Carolina Writers Conference, in 1950 was the first year that that, that organization started for writers. And they met on the stage of the Lost Colony uh, to honor Paul Green and also to encourage people to come. 1949. 19, uh -huh. Yes, sir. Uh, you touched on it a little bit. What sort of relationship, professional, relationship that Thomas Wolfe and Paul Green have, if any, what did they think of each other and each other's work 
and which one was the smartest? <laughs> <laughs> well, if we could ask John Ely. <laughs> um, well, he, he was a powerhouse, wasn't he? Uh, Thomas Wolfe came to school, I think he was 16 years old, mm -hmm. six foot seven. Mm -hmm. He rode on the top of the uh, refrigerator. Uh, he, had, he had such a troubled <coughs> childhood with his family in, in Asheville. And, you know, he lived in a boarding house. And so he never even knew what bed he was going to sleep in. It was the one that the boarders were not taking, taken. That was called the old, my old Kentucky home. Um, I'm not going to be able to answer your question very well. I do know that Paul was an a honorary pallbearer of Thomas Wolfe and a close relationship. Of course, he was much older. Uh, well, not much older. Um, so, no, not much older. Uh, Paul was born only six years older. I think uh, Thomas Wolfe was born in 1930. And, I mean, 1900. And Paul was born in 94. Uh, in, uh, so that's only six years. Um, Paul was, a, Paul was a, a very economic writer, and you may know that Thomas Wolfe was very lyrical and, and wrote mountains of work, and that he had quite an interesting relationship with his, with his editor, Maxwell Perkins, at Samuel French. And, um, but we don't see much through their lives that they, that they interacted. No, sir, and I need to find out more about that. Well, uh, Wolfe wanted to be a playwright. Well, you know, he went to Harvard and studied playwriting, but it didn't work out for him. But and Paul wanted to be a poet, mm -hmm. you know, so they, so they changed their genre. Sort of but they play. both have that Chapel Hill tie, though. They do. Mm -hmm. They do. The mm -hmm. love of Chapel Hill. Mm -hmm. And of course, you see, Paul was there, didn't come until 1919, so he's coming two years after, Paul, uh, I guess, Thomas Wolfe has come, yeah. while he was in the trenches of France. He was in very very serious uh, fighting in Belgium and France, in the trenches. Marcia, tell us. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, he's been raising his hand. Go yeah, ahead. Really. Well, my question is, after his indoctrination by an association with Professor Williams, did he maintain any spirituality at all? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. And as a matter of fact, uh, he was not a church person. He, uh, when he went to the hospital on one occasion, and they wanted to know, you know, what church you belong to and so forth. And he had this little card in his billfold that said he was a, a, a humanist. <laughs> and so he was not a church person. Uh -huh. um, I was going to ask you to tell us about, you've traveled all around representing the foundation, what you've learned about the other outdoor dramas. I bet most people didn't know how many he wrote. Mm -hmm. We just know about the Lost mm -hmm. Colony. Yeah. And some of them didn't last very long, as the Lost Colony was not supposed to last very long. Uh, he wrote one, uh, Wilderness Road, which is out in Berea, Kentucky. Now, that went on for quite a while, and that's really good. And Of course, as you know, what the outdoor dramas are is the story that happened in that place. Mm -hmm. And so that was the point of it, that the people in that community could come out in their overalls anyway, because he was so determined that people, the regular people, were going to have an opportunity for theater. And so then, uh, when he wrote the Texas musical drama in Canyon, Texas, it's in a canyon, and it's all about the railroad coming through versus the, the, the ranchers versus the railroad, so it's, it's the tension in that story. Uh, in uh, Common Glory, which was done in, up in the uh, D.C. area, was just for a short while. Uh, that was for a bicentennial of some sort. Um, we have one in Ohio that's going still called Trumpet in the Land. And it's about a Moravian uh, minister who comes through and uh, he, and, and the Indians are there and the Indians have, you know, had to put clothes on and they've changed, you know, they've taken the Indian sort of life away from them as it were. It's a tragic story, a uh, true story. They're all true stories. And that makes it very interesting. Yes, sir. I'm, I don't want to be too. Uh, I want you to just keep asking. But where specifically in Hornet County was he born? Well, the house is still there. Um, it's on the road right there. Uh, they they might some when I've asked the kids, they some of them will say, well, it was a Lillington address. And now somebody will say, well, it was a Bowie's Creek address, you know, because it's rural. It's out in the country. 
So uh, I could get back and tell you exactly where that is, but it's right there. And family still lives in that house. And sometimes when people reach a certain point of notoriety, they kind of abandon their home area. How did and that was absolutely 100% not the case with Paul Green. The children have told me, these children that are 93 and 90, <laughs> the children have told me that they're, they, they were going to Harnett. It was never, you know, we're going to Harnett County, we're going to Harnett. He had to come home, he came home and came home. So he was a beloved son. It never got to his head. He was just a, a wonderful, down-to-earth person. And I wanted to answer the story, a, a, answer it this way too, is that he had read the complete Bible by the time he was 10. And then he read it again. And his mama, she named him Paul, for St. Paul. So the family, the mother was religious and played in the, sometimes you didn't have the service in your church every Sunday. You'd have to go to a different place. And so that was a country sort of way. And so he, he was raised up in the church, uh, but he did not stay with the church. But he knew, he knew the Bible and he uses it in his work a lot in many of his outdoor dramas, and of course, some of them are religious. I mean, he's clearly a, a, a Bible scholar. 